This is a new voice for a new Scotland. Today we're delighted to be talking to Dr Craig Dayell from uh, Commonweal, who's the Director of Policy and Research there, and he's going to be talking to us today about universal basic income. So shortly we're going to be just trying to contact Craig via Skype. Hello? Hi, Val. Hi, Hello, Craig. Yes, I can hear you really well. You're live on right. IndieLive.radio with myself and right. Marlene. How are, how are you today? I'm good, yourself? Yeah. Very well, thank yeah. you. As I was saying, thanks very much for um, getting back to us so quickly to, to come on the programme this morning. How are you no doing? Are you OK? My mum's in the hospital just now. Not, not COVID, she fell and broke her leg. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Aye. So uh, it's been a bit of a juggling, juggling work lockdown and helping her. Are you able to go and visit her? Is that no? Nope. You can't. Nope, you can't visit. even visit her. Oh god, that must be that hellish. Just no. Makes it worse. No, I'm allowed. I'm allowed to take bags of things uh, to her, but I have to leave them at the leave them at the, the front of the ward. Uh, oh yeah, god, yeah. that's yeah. awful. Uh, she's been look, well looked after. The staff yeah. are amazing. So we're so, delighted to welcome you on today's program. Um, Marlene is a lot more clued up than me about common wheels. <laughs> she goes to she's been to loads of your events. I'm I'm certainly a supporter and a follower. And I've been reading some of the articles, but um, I'm not quite as knowledgeable about the green side of it and the issues as Marlene. Oh, thank so you. No, pre- her... no pressure there then, Val. <laughs> but um, universal basic income is yes. definitely something, an idea that almost like it's yeah. time has come, isn't it? Shall I tell, give uh, Craig a little bit of background to to this? Because... Um, as Val said, there's been a few people sort of coming up with that phrase, aren't there, about an idea whose time has come. And uh, we've we've been doing this series of interviews, Craig, under the admittedly rather unwieldy title of <laughs> Coronavirus Impacts and the Way Forward for Scotland. So we, we've done about six of these inter- interviews. And I, I think certainly on five of the six, the, the subject of universal basic income has come up. I mean, Leslie Riddick uh, talked a wee bit about it. We, we, mm-hmm. talked to, we talked to Alan Smith and Philippa Whitford. They both bought it up. And, of course, you know, the SNP at Westminster are trying to... I uh, don't suppose it's ever going to happen, but at least they're talking about it. George Caravan we talked a bit about it. And Val's just been telling me he's got an article in today's national about universal mm-hmm. bacon so it was a, a in amongst a, a sort of more general set of topics in the interviews this one kept coming up so we thought okay let's pick it up and see if we can just go into it in, in a wee bit more depth hence hence talking to you <laughs> if I was saying I'm a bit more knowledgeable but I don't know if that's really true but um, at any rate I have done a little bit of reading around it so and I, I did find the article the, the post that's on your blog really really useful just as a you know well it's going to say an introduction to the idea but you go go into it in some depth as well so is it something mm. that yourself and commonweal definitely uh, would like to see as as a, a policy uh, it, well in scotland or the uk it's quite interesting this uh, this policy has been a core commonweal policy since before commonweal was commonweal ah, um, oh, wow. back yeah. uh, back during the, the the independence referendum campaign back oh. in 2013 when commonweal was a a campaign within another think tank the jimmy reed foundation they they published a, a paper looking at the, the benefits of, amongst other things, a, a universal basic income and produced, produced a costed model for Scotland. It was one of the first papers that really caught my attention and got me looking at Commonweal, really. Right. Um, I mean, I, I, I'd met Robin quite early on in the campaign and I was listening to his ideas, but that was one of the papers that really kind of caught me and thought, oh, this I really need to pay attention to this group. So I wasn't even really involved with Commonweal right. back then. Right. Predates right. me. Um, and that's saying something um, Craig (laughs) (laughs) so I mean there's loads of other groups in Scotland who have been working on uh, basic income as well very notably the Citizens Basic Income Network in Scotland they they are really the core people in Scotland who have been working on this so uh, we've got a lot to We're standing on the shoulders of giants as right. well. It's not, yeah, just, yeah. not just all of us. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I came across some uh, things also in the RSA website. 
It's quite a lot. RSA there. Scotland, yeah, yes, RSA Jamie, Scotland. Jamie Cook there yeah. um, has been doing some some wonderful work in promoting basic income. We've seen other think tanks such as Reform Scotland, who are much more to the right of politics compared to Commonweal. Yeah. They are coming into the idea of yeah. a, a universal basic income. They produced a paper in 2016. In 2017, Commonweal came back to the idea when I produced a paper on slightly broader than just common, we were looking at the potential options for social security for an independent Scotland. At the time, we had just had the Smith Commission, we had just had the Scotland Act 2016 passed. So Scotland was starting to look at the, the welfare ref, um, powers that had been devolved as part right. of that package. Yeah. They were forming, in the process of forming Social Security Scotland. So they were they were very much looking at what could be done as a devolved unit. Uh, but we decided to try and keep the agenda just going that little bit further as well uh-huh. and, and say right okay these are th- this is what can be done with the new devolved powers but if we were an independent country what else could we look at and i, I went through a variety of interesting policies uh, but one of them was again universal basic income so i laid out what a universal basic income is what it would mean the potential impacts and i produced another costed model for scotland it was at that time quite a quite a low level basic income we weren't offering any uh, much more than what's currently being offered under unemployment benefit or universal credit we did that because we at that time back in 2017 you know an eternity yes, ago we were yeah. still fighting the argument over could it be done what are the mechanisms how could it be deployed yeah, yeah. still fighting the basic argument of what it is and now <laughs> three years later yeah it, it, there's there's broad support uh, we've had several polls recently showing above 60% of people in Scotland are in favour of a universal basic income, either right now as part of the crisis response or you know even permanently beyond that. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's been fascinating being in that journey for, yeah, for, yeah. for this period yeah. of time and seeing how things have shifted. Yeah, so is it even, I mean, is it even possible to have some sort of, basic income under the current devolution settlement. I mean, I I just usually start off with thinking, oh, that's just such a good idea. And I know there's some evidence that, you know, that it, it has good effects. I mean, it has good effects partly on well-being as well. But at the back of my mind, I'm always going, well, yeah, but we, we wouldn't be able to do it, would we? But maybe I'm wrong. Right, can we please break out of this argument of, of okay. Scotland canny day until okay. proven otherwise? Because there's so many things that actually, when the political world turns, it shows that we can actually do yeah, it. Yeah, okay, it just fair needs a enough. Bit of thinking yep. of. So, okay, so fair enough. Try, try, try and get into the mode of thinking of if we should do it, we should try to do it until we hit a barrier. You know, oh. don't put barriers up until you hit them. Okay, good, <laughs> good thinking. Yeah, yeah. That said, <laughs> right. Um, Broadly speaking, it would be very difficult for uh, for Scotland with the powers that we currently have to put in a basic income. Some of the bigger barriers is we don't have full control over the income tax powers, especially things like personal allowance, that, that zero rate band. Um, and that really throws up a bit of a quite a, quite a significant barrier uh, to put in UBI. More significantly, a lot of this, a lot of the infrastructure is still controlled by HMRC and the DWP. Yeah. And they are not showing a great willingness to facilitate this kind of thing. So you've got to think about how would giving money to someone interact with other uh, aspects of of the UK welfare system. So if they have universal credit, if you give them money with one hand, do they lose money on the other? Uh, you, you can you can see this kind of filtering through all sort of interactions with the yeah. The well, I mean, UK certainly, system. certainly, as universal credit set up at the moment, if someone was getting an additional payment that was a basic income, they would just immediately lose their universal credit or a part of it anyway, wouldn't they? Mm. Yeah. This this is one of the the real scandals of universal credit. Oh, if I you're know. on universal credit and you if you're on universal credit if um, and you earn one pound then you can have your universal credit deducted by up to 63 pence. So that's a 63% effective tax if you're mm-hmm. on universal credit, instituted by the people who say that a 50% tax on millionaires is far too high. <laughs> well, you can even lose your universal credit if all you've received is your holiday pay from before yeah. you even went on to universal 
Credit, you know, it's just awful. I mean, I've seen oh, people oh. in 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 real states about that at Citizens Advice Bureau. I mean, it's dreadful, it's, inhumane. Yeah, it's an abs- absolute nightmare if you're on overtime or if you're a freelancer and you're yeah. you're not on regular payments. Or there was a quite a famous example um, not that long ago when Greg's the the, the bakery company. Uh, tried to give all of its employees a £300 bonus. Yeah. Uh-huh. And yeah, a lot of the folk who were on low income, especially the ones who were on universal credit, ended up seeing almost all of it just disappear because, that's yeah, they got the money, but they lost their benefits. Yeah, that's, that's terrible. One of the, 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 the great advantages, one of the great things about a universal basic income is it gives you this income floor and anything you get on top of that, yes, it might be taxed at a progressive rate, but you're not having money pulled away from you right. from other sources so it gives you a much more secure foundation to your finances you know that you will be able to to pay for this amount of the these bills can i ask craig um and this is like a sort of basic level of in ignorance but i'm i'm thinking that quite a lot of you're, you're here to enlighten people and i'm sure a lot of our listeners are you maybe don't need to find out more and what I'd like to know is so how does the concept of universal basic income how does that kind of mesh in with the existing benefit system it doesn't Mm. replace it then it it works in tandem is that how it works I mean I know it's already been trialed in some countries isn't it like is it Finland or there's been a few trials around uh, around the world over the years. Mm-hmm. Uh, Finland's one of the notable recent examples. Yeah, we jumped into this conversation almost in the middle. Folks <laughs> coming into the coming into the show must be very confused if they've never heard of the UBI before. So maybe we'll talk about. I think the, I think a lot of people it. have but, heard about it, but yeah. maybe like myself, they're not really they don't really fully understand yeah. how it operates. The core precept of a universal basic income is a, is a cash payment to every individual. Uh, that is sufficient to cover their basic needs and it is paid out universally regardless of your circumstances. Mm-hmm. That's a very brief sort of covering of what it is. How it works with the existing welfare system is it largely replaces good chunks of it. Okay. If you were if you were putting this onto the UK system, and we have to we can't just pretend that nothing exists and then create a new mm-hmm. system ex nihilo. We have to think about how we replace or modify the existing systems. You would start by looking at the benefits that you would replace with this new social security. I'm using my terminology very precisely here. Mm -hmm. I really despise the UK's term benefit. And I'm not so happy with welfare either. I do prefer the term social security. You'll see me using all three names, but I'll try and push us towards using social security, uh, you know, for the, the more progressive elements. So we can think about some of the the things that we would replace. You would certainly replace things like unemployment benefit. You would replace most of universal credit, although you might have to keep things like uh, housing benefit um, because the the housing market in the UK is so unbalanced and so geographically specific that you couldn't really replace that with a flat payment. Mm -hmm. You'd need you'd need to think about more policies to try and even that out. Commonweal's also been doing work on on housing policy in that regard. Uh, We published a paper uh, not that long ago um, on building more social housing to to help with that. You could think about replacing carer's allowance. You can think about replacing child benefits. So you can can go through the list, and I did this in my 2017 paper, and you can work out the the benefits that you would replace with this new social security. You also think about the ones that you wouldn't replace. I mentioned housing. Another really important one are anything to do with disability payments. These would not be replaced by a universal basic income. These would be, you know, you would keep disability payments and you would keep them in addition to a universal basic income. Because these, you know, people with disabilities are people with additional needs and they are very specific needs. They have to be addressed almost on a case by case basis. So mm-hmm. it's very, very important you build that into the system as well. Do it in a much fairer way. Do it in a much better way than the UK is doing. Don't have the same sort of really degrading system that the UK has. Sure, but that's a, that's a system that has to be protected. So you may also think about replacing the, the state pension with uh-huh. the universal yeah. basic income, especially if your, your, your UBI is at a substan- substantial level. 
people have talked about UBI schemes running from the very, very low scheme that I modeled on, you know, job seekers allowance level up to, you know, let's give everyone a thousand pound a month. Yeah. You know, there's a spectrum of these policies. So you can see things like the state pension could just be subsumed into yeah. the UBI. Just to uh, give us a bit of perspective, a thousand pounds a month is how does that compare with someone working full time and on the on the real living wage, which is it's about nine pounds an hour or something now, is it? Or the real living real living wage is 10? something more like eighteen to nineteen thousand pound a year. So even right, a thousand so pound a month would be below, below living that, wage, but you can yeah, yeah. you can you, you can, can just gauge you it. Can play, yeah, you can play yeah, with yeah. that number wherever you like. The, the consequences of setting your number at a certain level, you know, you have to work through the tax implications and the wealth distribution implications. Uh, and it does become harder the, the higher up you go in terms of it just becomes a model that nobody's tried before. Um, so it becomes harder to imagine what that kind of society might look like. That was mm-hmm. another reason I modeled uh, my 2017 paper at a very low level. Was, yeah, it was, it was yeah. It was a way of getting UBI as a policy getting all that infrastructure in, showing that it could work, and then you can start playing with that number. If you want to push it up, you can. Probably all of us who are currently receiving the state pension would be all in favour of moving over to a, a universal bake of income, because it would certainly be higher than the current UK state basic state pension, which is only about, I don't know, six or seven thousand pounds a year or something like that. Yeah, I mean, it might be, it might not be. Uh, I, I've seen schemes, again, that, that would have a, a very low basic income that would be less than the, the UK state pension, in which case, uh, I think this was I think this was one of the scenarios that Reform Scotland modelled in which they said, right, OK, if the UBI uh, covers part of your state pension, then you uh, reduce okay. the state pension yeah, by yeah, that amount. Yeah. So you end up with the same amount same of money, amount, it just yeah. comes from... Yeah. Two different accounts. Yeah. I would like to see the UBI up at a level that is sufficient for basic needs. You know, a, a universal income that doesn't cover the basic part of that isn't a UBI. I've got a question here for you, Craig, from yeah. uh, the public chat room, and it's from um, Fiona from uh, Clack Manager Women for Independence. Her question is Has Craig covered how to recoup UBI from tax? If not, how does that work? See, when so, I hear the word tax, my brain immediately <laughs> um, freezes up. So please, um, I, li- I would love to hear your answer to that, Craig. That's probably <laughs> a sensible and rational response to hearing <laughs> I <tax>. don't know. <laughs> <laughs> right, sure. so, so yes, my 2017 paper did model the, the, the tax implications. We okay. uh, came up with what we called a revenue neutral model. So we worked out how much the, the UBI would cost. Uh, we then subtracted off the cost of the benefits that we'd be replacing. And then we came up with this this sum. I think, I can't remember the number off the top of my head. I think it was about £8 billion a year for Scotland that it would need to find uh, in addition to, to make that revenue neutral. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we also created a, a change to the income tax scales to to raise that amount. It's, a, it's work that has been done in other schemes as well. So there was a, a, a UBI created by Bath University in 2016, 2017 that, that did a similar thing. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm aware of other groups that have used similar kinds of modelling. That one came out to uh, having the top rate of tax somewhere in the low 50s. I think it was about 53%. It wasn't a huge, huge. change. Oh. Uh, what it actually meant was if you were on a salary of about £33,000 or less, you would end up better off with the UBI scheme that, that we created. If you were on more than that, then you would end up slightly paying slightly more. Mm-hmm. Why would you vote for something like that if you were paying a little bit more? Well, if you wanted to see the societal benefits, great. But also, one of the big benefits for a UBI if you're on a high wage is still that security of income. I know people who you know, have been on a fairly high but irregular wage, again, freelancers, things like that. Um, I know people who have wanted to set up a business. I've been in this position myself where we've had an idea for a business. So, right, this could be something that we want to pursue. But if I do this, I have no income until the, the business is profitable. And if the business fails, you know, I, I'm 
literally could not afford for that business to fail, so I'd ended up not pursuing that idea. There will be others in that position. If a universal basic income had been around, maybe giving that security of income to take a risk like that, maybe we'd see a lot more businesses created. That's yeah, really yeah. interesting because um, it, it, to me, when I hear universal basic income, it always seems to me that you know it, it, it's to do with social justice and supporting the vulnerable but that's a that's an, a different angle mm. that's an idea of it supporting entrepreneurship and creativity that that's that's really interesting i hadn't thought of that angle this is why i like to call it social security mm-hmm. that security aspect is is very yeah. important um, can I just uh, add a little postscript from Fiona, who asked that question? She would also like to thank you for retweeting the Clack's Wifey's podcast. <laughs> so <today laughs> thank you to you. Fiona, Fiona could, could, uh, she's shameless. She's shameless at protein Clack's Wifey's podcast. Fiona. <laughs> it's a really good podcast. I enjoy it. Yeah, it's it brilliant. Is, yeah. It really what, is. One interesting thing about this lockdown is we've all had a lot more time to to, to listen to podcasts. We've also had a lot more time to to create podcasts. Uh, so that's true. Little shameless plug for the Commonweal Policy <laughs> Podcast. If if you want to Absolutely. check that one out too, <laughs> I, I haven't heard it yet. So the, I mean, here we are in this situation, this lockdown situation, still, whether it's stay at home or stay alert or whatever. So if you'd been um, a chancellor of the Exchequer instead of Rishi Sunak, uh, wait, what would you have done different? I mean, a universal basic income would have been uh, immediately far more beneficial to a lot more people. I mean, I, I, I do appreciate that he was working with the tools that he had and he didn't want to create too many more new tools. So he was looking at ways of, of, uh, um, sort of getting money to people through the the tax system and then he had to think about how do you affect how do you do people who are self-employed and don't have paye he had to try and create new systems for that they're i don't think they're quite running yet um so it's a bit of a shambles you also have the the, the tory ideology that you know you you you've got to keep the workers working don't give people possible. money for free uh, don't give people money for nothing and the the, the really bizarre one is Oh, we, we we want to do something that's that's much better targeted than a universal system. That one irritated me. Uh, so that one that one showed a real, either fundamental misunderstanding of the 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 welfare system or a deliberate uh, ideological choice. Yeah. Because as soon as you start targeting, Commonweal again has a paper on the benefits on the the, the clear benefits of universalism. As soon as you t- start targeting. A system. As soon as you have that means testing, now you have to police it. Now you have to find the people who are claiming something yeah. that they're not owed. That's right. More crucially, you need to find the people who are not claiming something that they are owed. Yeah. And governments are always happy to complain about the first group. They're never, never quite so keen to go hunting for the second group. Yeah, exactly. They are the ones that I'm more yeah. worried about. Yeah, and because... then and and there's the costs to setting up the um yep. you know the whole kind of system if, it, if it's just universal like child benefit they just get it you know you don't have to pay for all that well yeah. there's still admin there but yeah. it's a lot less yeah it's a lot um, less yeah the issue with the you know making sure that your targeted system is actually correctly targeted is i mean yeah there will be people who cheat the system or or get get payments in error you can reclaim that it's it's relatively simple for the the UK to backdate a payment, but for the people who are not getting something, they are due. It's a lot harder to backdate your child's breakfast. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I know. Yeah. Can I ask you something, Craig? It, to me, this always seemed like a really positive policy, but I, I can see how folk might think it's a bit left, at least a bit left of centre, more left wing. But I was completely gobsmacked today when I read that article in The National by George Kerevan, who and he's saying that, in actual fact, universal basic income is also a policy that is promoted by some very right wing yep. politicians and think tanks and has been for quite a long time. That was news to me. Um, and I would imagine some of the listeners and he said he he sort of says that it it could be quite a harmful thing in the wrong hands if it was done in the can you 
Can you say a bit about that? Shed a bit of light on that way, yeah. on that aspect? Yeah, so let, let's paint a, paint a little story of the, the kind of left-wing social democratic uh, common wheel future that, that I am in favour of, where universal basic income gives you the social security, not just to ensure that you can feed your child tomorrow, but also gives you the security to take part in society. Yeah. Right, that's that's kind of the vision that I'm trying to promote. That that all of us first, a society is only as strong as the weakest uh, member. At the very very other end, right, you've got the far right or the libertarian, the extreme libertarian model of the only good government is no government. You know, government should be as small as possible. They should have no interference. There should be no policies whatsoever. Their version of a UBI is one in which everybody gets cash. And they use that to buy the services that they need from the free market. So oh. the government doesn't produ- doesn't provide you with education or healthcare or policing or sewage. You get your money and you go and buy it. Right? It's a very, very different future. So this is where you get that. People say, oh, UBI has cross-party support. It does, but for very different reasons. This is a new voice. For a new Scotland. And in life,